Hey everyone, I think the room's gone ominously quiet. Um, yeah, my name is Sam Dutton. I work for Chrome Developer Relations in London. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk today about the mobile web and uh, you know, hopefully give you some techniques for improving the performance of your mobile web apps. Um, it's funny, my first brush with Google was actually years ago trying to build an offline news app using Google Gears on Pocket PC, so that kind of dates me. Um, these slides are available online if you get connectivity at some point. Uh, you can grab them there. There's some, I think, some useful links in these slides especially. So I'm going to talk about a stack of stuff uh, relating to particularly performance on the web, on mobile. Um, and really looking at it from a kind of, uh, you know, the whole picture. And uh, going to be finishing off actually, in fact, talking a little bit about uh, power consumption because this is you know, a really important part of uh, the performance of your apps now on the web is, is dealing with those things. There's a lot of stuff to deal with. And when I was thinking about this, you know, I was just for a start having trouble working out in my own head, you know, what the mobile web is. Um, you know, there's a Chromebook with a SIM card. Is that a mobile device? Uh, this Sony Vio 20-inch touchscreen the whole family's meant to use, you know, is that mobile? Um, this nice car, um, these crazy glasses that uh, were a big hit at the uh, New York Fashion Week uh, earlier in the year. Um, you know, the one thing that all these different devices have in common is that they've all got a browser, so they all support web apps. Uh, Facebook is telling us they're, they're getting something like seven, this was a few months ago, like 7,000 different devices uh, using their sites every day. Um, you know, and I was looking back at the stuff from last year at DevOps, and it just amazes me how much the web has changed since then, particularly the uh, arrival of these, these new APIs that are really pushing the limits of what, uh, what you people are doing, you know, what we're doing on mobile and pushing the limits, I think, of, of hardware as well, particularly uh, with stuff like uh, WebRTC coming on board. Uh, you know, performance is, I think, becoming more and more important uh, on mobile. Um, and, you know, looking at all those different uh, APIs, obviously we can't really predict what's going to happen. One thing, of course, we do know is that uh, mobile web usage is overtaking desktop, uh, already has in many countries. Uh, this is a, uh, so a really interesting uh, presentation by Joe McCann, quoted these uh, figures. In basically, the point here is that uh, in the BRIC countries, uh, we're seeing massive take up of uh, mobile, and that that's where a lot of apps are going. Uh, so, particularly for you know Brazil, Russia, India, China, uh, you know, in these countries, in emerging markets, a computer is a smartphone. They're kind of the same thing. Um, more recently, great David Story article uh, about usage in Africa. I don't know if you can see these figures, but essentially. Uh, in, I think it's in Nigeria, you've got something like 72% of web usage is on mobile. And the numbers there are huge. In Nigeria, we have there are like 100 million mobile users. So these emerging markets are really going to make you know, an additional push on the number of people using web apps and the importance of getting performance right. Uh, closer to home, the UK, uh, one figure here, like the, the Mail Online now has it's like the biggest news website in the world now. It has 100 million users per month, and a third of those are on mobile. So mobile is hugely important. This is a photograph of Facebook presentation showing you know, they're great uh, native apps, but of course uh, their mobile web stuff is still really, really important to them. Um, another thing that we've discovered, some research from Gomez shows that uh, users are actually expecting like uh, you know, better performance on mobile and desktop, potentially. And this is increasing all the time. Um, and, you know, we've, we've come from this, this world of, of years and years of the kind of desktop situation where you have, you know, it's been the same old, same old with a keyboard, a monitor, and a box under the table, and nothing else. And now we've got these, uh, these mobile devices where, you know, optimization of performance is, is more and more complex. These are more complex devices. Um, some uh, charts that I nicked from Ilya Grigorik's talk um, showing that, you know, the problem with this is that mobile is slow. Mobile performance is a real problem. Um, and, yeah, if you look at Ilya's talk from, from yesterday, the, 
The, the other thing that he points out is that there's a, there's, a real, there's real damage to business. He's got some great figures from Bing, actually, showing how uh, mobile web performance problems uh, really damage their business. So the good news is that, in fact, uh, you know, it's the same old, same old. Like, really, the biggest thing to take away from this is, you know, kind of, it's the same thing. It's like 1999 all over again. Uh, the important, most important thing is less requests, smaller file size. And actually, one thing I discovered looking at HTTP Archive Mobile is that uh, we've still got to reduce the number of errors. We're still getting a lot of errors when uh, there are requests for pages. And of course, that's a you know, major dent in, in mobile performance. So kind of picking it apart a bit, uh, we've got different components of the performance stack, so to speak. Obviously, the network carriers and so on, the actual hardware, the devices we're using, the software, so the browsers and the actual apps we're running on them. Um, but on mobile, we've got this other thing, which is really different from what we're used to on mobile, on, on desktop, which is that we've got to consider context because in particularly thinking about performance, you know, your performance requirements are very different with like a user who's kind of uh, lying back on the sofa watching telly, sort of distracted, and some guy's walking down the street and is really stressed out trying to use their bank app. Um, so, you know, it's kind of the same old rules apply in some ways, but of course we've got a lot of differences between desktop and mobile. Um, and I'd like to kind of go into detail at some of these. I, I think the core concept with mobile is this thing of variability. You know, particularly, like I say, users this, are always doing different stuff. And that's, you know, about like all kinds of stuff like mood, location, context, and so on. But we've also got this problem of these variations in latency. And I'll talk a bit about latency because that, I think, is almost the crux of our problem with mobile now. Um, and of course, we've got uh, bandwidth that's much harder to predict uh, on mobile. You know, it depends on where you are, like in relation to in the cell, within the cell, uh, the time of day, and and different carriers. Um, so yeah, here's a, a recent W3C presentation. They did some tests, and you know, basically what this shows is you've got massive variation in what they tested for performance between different carriers. Um, and uh, yeah, that makes it really hard to, to, to work out what's causing the problems with performance, of course. But we have some ways around that. Uh, the other obvious point about mobile is this business of instability. Um, one thing I've really noticed is, you know, like, uh, like me and my colleagues have these lovely Galaxy Nexus phones, but, uh, you know, a lot of the world are using cheaper phones, and we need to consider uh, how the world is on these cheaper low-spec devices. Uh, you know, there are essentially going to be a lot more failures in, in the user's interactions if we don't design web apps right. So just to uh, begin by talking about latency, um, this chart, I don't know if people have seen this from HTTP Archive, but essentially what this shows is that uh, our websites, our web apps are using, you know, more and more... Um, file transfer. So they're making more and more requests and they're averaging something like uh, 80, between 80 and 90 requests per page. Um, and this is a real problem when you've got a slow return trip time between the browser and the server that it's getting the stuff from. And uh, not only that, but we're seeing actually an increase in page size. Um, and, you know, I believe that actually page speeds aren't essentially the figures are that they're not getting faster. Um, the problem is that um, the improvement in bandwidth that we've seen doesn't actually solve the problem. Um, so what you've got here on, on the left-hand side is a chart of bandwidth. And what you see there is that uh, page load time uh, improves up to a point uh, when you get to about uh, 4 megabits. And then it begins to flatten out. And now, you know, that interestingly is the kind of point of, uh, at which we're getting to with our, our connectivity in, in many contexts. Um, on the other hand, as you uh, improve latency, you get this linear relationship, improved page load times. Now, the point about this is that latency is much worse for mobile than it is to, for desktop. So it's very, very important for us to consider 
the, the file requests we're making on the desktop. Um, and like I say, you know, we're lucky to get uh, return trip times on mobile of about 100 milliseconds. Um, of course, you know, we can, we can uh, use uh, CDNs and all that stuff, but that's not always possible. Um, and the, the other problem is on mobile, of course, that the first hop you know, can be slow. Like if the radio is off, well, you've got a whole, you know, you've got a whole set of problems anyway. But essentially, the, uh, the first hop, so to speak, to the carrier can be very, very slow after that. Um, and, you know, however quickly we, however much we optimise, we've got this kind of speed of light problem. You know, um, optical fibre, uh, it takes about one and a half times as long as the speed of light to get from point A to point B, uh, which to me is a, like a miracle. But, um, you know, it also means that the return trip time, say, from, uh, from Antwerp to California is maybe like 100 milliseconds or whatever. There's a really nice um, app by Ilya Grigoric actually that shows you the, uh, how far you can get at the speed of light uh, on, on a kind of world map. And it's great to get a sort, of, a sort of sense of that, a feeling of how actually how slow that is and what a problem that is. So what we need to do is reduce the number of requests. Um, now, if we look at uh, HTTP archive mobile, um, what we discover is there's this high correlation between page load speed and or problems and, uh, and the number of images and the way images are used. So it's good to start with thinking about images. Uh, there's obviously a stack of ways that we can reduce the number of uh, requests we have for images in the page. Um, I won't go into these in detail, but uh, you know, it really is worth trying out these things. Um, as I'll come on to, you know, I think all the uh, suggestions I'm going to give have pros and cons. There are good and bad things about all these techniques. Obviously, we can, uh, we can do things to reduce the number of, of JavaScript and CSS requests. You know, we can, uh, we can combine files together and uh, we can use resource loaders and so on. Of course, the, uh, the kind of gotcha there is that combining uh, JavaScript files can uh, mean that we have slower parse times, so there's always this trade-off. Um, you know, I, I guess the, uh, the bottom line is that we need to be careful in any of these things to, uh, to, you know, to test what we're doing. Um, and of course, you know, particularly on the web, on the mobile web, I think it's this crucial thing of uh, getting rid of what you don't need. Um, redirects are a real problem and, you know, they, they, they're causing a lot of slowness and, and looking at HTTP Archive, uh, again, we've got a huge proportion of, uh, of redirects that are taking place on the mobile web. Um, you can look at window.performance uh, to check the redirect cost, in other words, the time taken for redirects on your page. Um, and as I'll show you, you can get that data from, uh, from Google Analytics now, so window performance data. Um, one thing that, uh, you know, that, that is, cause a huge problem on the mobile web, I think much more than we've seen on desktop, is this problem of bottlenecks too. So uh, it's, it's particularly important on mobile web, on your mobile web app sites, uh, to avoid bottlenecks. So th these are single points of failure, you know, like uh, JavaScript without which the page won't work, um, CSS without which the page won't be usable at all. So it's this point of eliminating these uh, single points of failure. Uh, also thinking about web fonts. Now we can do a few things just simply to uh, reduce the, uh, the amount of bandwidth we use and to improve network usage. Um, a couple of tricks here which you know, may or may not improve speeds for you uh, is to use uh, DNS prefetching or uh, pre-rendering. Um, obviously neither of these is guaranteed. Um, these are just hints to the browser to try to uh, kind of give it a heads up on what the user might do next. Um, and of course we can improve speeds by using uh, open source libraries from CDNs and so on. Um, a stack of things, I think, you know, thinking about images, because these, these have really become, uh, the, in a sense at the moment, the biggest problem on the mobile web. Uh, the, the obvious thing, firstly, is to say, you know, we need to use the right format for the right job. So, you know, uh, 
JPEG for raster images and so on and so on. And to think about using good compression tools, stuff like TinyPNG and so on. Um, and uh, one kind of obvious thing to point out, but I see this again and again, is like people using uh, image compression at too high a quality than they actually need for a mobile site. So I think this is a kind of relic of, I don't know, like print design or whatever, or people just like to see these higher quality images. You know, almost like start from the bottom and work up when you're trying to work out what quality to save, uh, save JPEGs as. And, um, you know, it's obviously really important to, uh, to get the right resolution and, and do that stuff. And of course, the old thing of don't, you know, resize in HTML. Uh, sorry, don't, you know, don't leave the browser to resize. Give dimensions in, in CSS. Um, one other thing I'd, I'd really like to, to pick up on that is an uh, interesting article recently by Dan Sherman, I don't know if anyone saw this, um, pointing out that, a lo that some networks, I think like in the States, I think it's T-Mobile, I'm not sure in Europe, but uh, uh, are actually, like the, the networks are doing image compression. So this is kind of really messing up our, our uh, sense of, of what works and what doesn't um, because there is... As far as I understand it, there is no way to detect if the network is actually uh, compressing images for you. Um, check out that, uh, that article by Dan Sherman. It goes into more detail. Um, it's not the be all and end all. Lots of networks don't compress images. You can't rely on it and so on and so on. But it's something that you really need to consider. Uh, and a great uh, article on HTML5 rocks there about using high DPI images. Um, I, I saw this uh, the um, blog post which interested me, you know, the way we're actually using um, images and, uh, you know, we're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of GIFs still on, on the web and this was a sample of like the top 200 Alexa sites, I think. And uh, it's interesting to see the PNG 24s there. And, um, you know, the... The, uh, the point made by Joav Weiss in this, in this blog post was that, in fact, we can use a lot of lossless techniques to get rid of, uh, to get rid of you know, what, to reduce the size of our images. Um, and the other thing that uh, we've discovered is that a lot of developers, sadly, are using PNG24, you know, where really, like, in fact, a JPEG would be appropriate because it's maybe, a, you know, it's a photographic image or whatever but people are using PNG 24s for transparency. So, I mean, the only thing I can say there is, you know, we, we really hope that, uh, we look forward to WebP being uh, widely adopted. Obviously, it's not out there yet. Um, there's a stack of techniques uh, that you can, uh, you can use to reduce the size and the number of, uh, of, of uh, CSS and JavaScript files. Um, one thing I've, I've particularly noticed is, is uh, websites where, I think particularly where they, they go through multiple iterations and, you know, templating becomes very complex and deeply nested and, uh, you know, I, I think uh, you, you're often seeing these very complex page structures which come down to kind of years of different people working on the same site and adding their own bits and pieces. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really, really crucial now to, to start cutting the bloat. I noticed on, like, the Amazon home page, the, the page size is now something like 220,000 characters, you know, that's, that's kind of crazy. And Facebook, like a Facebook page is, I think it's nearly 400, like, it's just a web page, you know, it's just, anyway. Um, uh, yeah, one, one sort of gotcha there at the end, that something I, I didn't know actually, that, um, that if you're using media queries, uh, files are still being downloaded, so there we go, that's a kind of sad fact, but... There's nothing much you can do about that. Um, obviously, we can do stuff to make sure we keep files on the client. Um, now, it's worth remembering that browser caching on the client isn't what you may be used to on desktop. Uh, there's a, a great uh, a presentation from Jackson, uh, Jackson Gallard at Facebook a few weeks ago. And one thing, he, he made this great comment. He said, any time you spend on the network is risk time, you know. Um, I really like that idea that, you know, that we're working in this kind of, you know, offline first world um, and we, we really need to take advantage of these techniques. Um, as I understand it, the W3C is working pretty hard to uh, avoid the problem or solve the problems with app cache. Uh, check out Jake 
Archibald's article, app cash is a douchebag. Um, it, there's some problems there, but uh, you know there are ways and means to keep stuff offline and store stuff, and that's that's obviously good in terms of performance and and simply you know enabling your websites on mobile to work when users don't have connectivity. Um, there's a stack of stuff we can do to reduce parse time. So for to uh, reduce JavaScript parse time, but also um, of the DOM. Um, the first thing to say is, of course, JavaScript is basically a lot slower on mobile than desktop. Um, and you know, there's a stack of techniques we can use now to actually avoid JavaScript. It's kind of you know the old rule about uh, do it in HTML if you can. If you can't, try CSS. If you can't do it in that use JavaScript. And what we've got now is, uh, I'll show some techniques in CSS for animations and so on that we can use instead of JavaScript. And um, we've got these really useful uh, HTML5 elements now. Um, you know, we've got stuff like the, the detail summary element, which means you don't have to script some kind of reveal, conceal part for different <clears throat> parts of your content. Um, and we've got the, uh, the track element, which will be coming to mobile. This is for putting uh, captions and subtitles on videos. So again, you know, a way of, when it's, when it's uh, implemented, that would be a way of uh, avoiding you know, complex JavaScript by using the, the kind of richness of HTML5. And the last point here I just wanted to make was um, that it's, it's really good to understand your JavaScript engine. There's a link there to a great talk, uh, Daniel Clifford at uh, Google I.O., about the V8 uh, engine and you know, little tricks you can do in your code to kind of improve your algorithms to take advantage of the way that the uh, engine works. Um, obviously, there's a stack of things you can do to... Uh, to improve the DOM, and it's the kind of same old thing about you know get your CSS early and your JavaScript late, roughly speaking. Um, one really good thing to do, it's a really simple, like as they say, low hanging fruit, um, is to specify a character set so you don't have to force the browser to guess, and you get you know the delay that comes with that. So you can do that by a meta element, uh, or better still, by uh, putting it uh, putting that information in the response header. Um, there's a stack of tricks, of course, to uh, defer JavaScript parsing where you can to uh, delay parsing until it's absolutely necessary. And then there's a, a set of things we can do to reduce the amount of repainting. You know, the, the one crucial thing that you have to do on mobile, of course, is to reduce the amount of work the browser does. Um, and, and one of the biggest things with that is to, to avoid the browser having to calculate stuff. Uh, in particular, in relation to page layout. So, um, some points there are that, you know, stuff I think we got used to on desktop. Um, you need to avoid, wherever possible, getting dynamic content at the top of a page that will then force a, uh, a repaint reflow lower down the page. And, you know, again, some of the same old rules, but now they're, they're, they're really extra important of uh, specifying uh, element width and height wherever possible. Um, there's good stuff you can do in CSS. You can uh, take advantage of hardware acceleration. Uh, there's a stack of things you can do with transforms, um, which, uh, if you're lucky, I mean, should be run on the GPU. That's not guaranteed, but uh, that will often mean a performance improvement. I just wanted to now kind of change gears a little bit um, and talk a bit more about performance in terms of the user experience and the you know the interface itself because I think this is uh, this is kind of a crucial component as it's kind of more important now on uh, mobile devices where users are more demanding and the uh, the devices are much more under pressure. So the two old usability laws here. Um, uh, Fitz law, which essentially uh, says that uh, you know the the bigger a control is, the closer it is to where the user is at some point, then uh, the quicker it is to get access to. In other words, you know, bigger things, closer things, uh, easier to get at. It's kind of obvious, um, but this is crucial for apps that are being used under stress, where you know users are just uh, have the you know this incredible ability to. I know I do it myself, where you just you do the thing you didn't mean to do because it was too small. Um, and yeah, Hicks law is a kind of variation on that, which is essentially that um, 
you know, that, that in any kind of interface, the more stimuli mean slower response times. So again, on mobile, this has become hugely important. Um, a, uh, a, a great point that, uh, that I've, I've heard made by Jonathan Stark is, you know, that we should think calculator when we're doing uh, mobile apps. Um, the point of this is that uh, we're used to having controls at the top of pages on desktop. Um, what we need to do is, is think about you know, the fact that when you're using the device, you, you don't want your hands over the uh, content area. It's kind of obvious, but I still see a lot of websites for mobile that actually have that problem where you know, the controls are at the top of the page. Um, now, thinking about text, uh, this is you know, so often something I struggle with on, uh, on sites that uh, where you know, what you really want is for the whole kind of journey, so to speak, of entering text in an app to be, to be really smooth. So you know, really thinking through that uh, from start to finish. Um, and uh, what we can use now is, is a stack of different input types which give us the right keyboards. And this is going to, you know, this will improve performance. And a lot of this is also about the perception of performance. So users uh, will be able to get the right keyboard depending on what kind of data they're entering. Um, the other old rule is crucial for mobile, which is, you know, don't put the uh, ejector seat button next to the cabin lights button. In other words, don't put uh, controls side by side that to do two very different things, like don't put delete next to save, all that stuff, which was always important but is uh, crucial to, uh, to the mobile web. Great old cartoon from Gary Larson there. So what we're trying to do is, uh, we're actually trying to reduce the amount of user interaction, if that makes sense. Um, you know, the important thing, it, it's become crucial for mobile, is users to be able to get at the content without having to, having to do anything. Um, I just wanted to show you uh, something that Brad Frost has just developed called Disco Mode. Um, so if I go to so if I go to Canary, um, so this is a, a site that uh, I've built, which has like simple examples of uh, kind of HTML5 y stuff, and uh, you know that looks that looks kind of okay on on the desktop. Now, uh, if you click size in this app, you get a viewport resizer, and uh, the point that Brad Frost is making is that the idea of fixed breakpoints for device sizes is, is just not the right approach and that we need to think about, uh, we need to think about content and base our breakpoints on content rather than device sizes. So he's, he's built this app which is called Ish and the point he's making is that we should think about things being smallish, mediumish or largeish and so on. So if I click uh, S for small there, you'll see I, it goes down to a size, again, a size like that. If I click it again, it goes to a slightly different size. Now what's happening is that he's uh, giving random values for that and um, what that means is that uh, you get this kind of stuff where I can see now that there's a real problem with these long URLs on this page um, that I need to deal with. Um, and again, this, this is a problem for, for performance because as soon as users hit this stuff, um, they, they are in for trouble. I noticed another, uh, you know, like this example on the same page, you know, the, uh, I've got array methods there and when it's nice and wide, you can see that that's on one line, but here it looks like I've got some other item which is every filter and uh, for each, which is, you know, confusing and is going to uh, slow down your user. Uh, Brad Frost has also introduced Disco Mode, uh, which does this, which is quite nice. It does this little sort of viewport dance, um, which again is a kind of great, it's kind of getting your head around uh, the mobile world and, uh, you know, how you, mobile world and, uh, you know, how you can improve performance with that. So, yeah, use the... Uh, use the meta viewport uh, facilities that we have on mobile because that's uh, a great way to make sure that your, your uh, website isn't you know, going off the side of the page. Um, thinking about uh, touch performance, um, I understand now there is actually a W3C working group for pointer events, which is great news, just, just happened. Um, 
But uh, yeah, beware of the uh, events you might be used to on desktop. You know, there's this delay uh, introduced on desktop browsers because, uh, of course, users on desktops uh, are used to double clicking. This doesn't happen on mobile, but we're left with those events that then introduce this 300 millisecond delay. Um, the best approach to this, I would say, is to read Boris's article because that goes into full details about how to cope with this. Um, it's a real problem if you stick with uh, click and mouse events. Um, you're going to have slowdowns. Now, one thing I noticed, uh, I, I did a search for images of touch gestures and touch interfaces, and I got this. I did another one for, I think this is like touch gestures. Um, and one thing I noticed in all these pictures is that you know, people are using these pointy fingers, like these fingers like that, whereas in reality, especially like, you know, when I see my daughter and her friends using devices, they, they, they grew up using game pads and stuff. They, they're using their thumbs, you know? So the, bottom, the point of this is that, uh, you know, humans have opposable digits. They like to use them. They, it means that, uh, you know, these are much bigger areas. You know, we don't have these little pointy stylus-like fingers. We have these big, fat thumbs. And we need to accept that that's the way our users use our sites. Um, a little bit about memory and performance. Uh, we did some tests at Google. And uh, we discovered, this is actually from a couple of years ago, uh, some tests of Gmail and so on. And the first thing we discovered, and this absolutely applies to mobile still, is that users are using mobile apps, mobile sites, for much longer than, we, that, than they used to. Um, you know, on, on desktop, people are leaving stuff open for days at a time, but on mobile devices, even so, you know, people are using apps for long stretches, and the problem is that uh, that means that we have to be really, really careful about memory leaks, um, because memory leaks will always end up causing, you know, damage to your performance, and as this chart shows here, where we've got... Uh, kind of latency showing essentially the responsiveness of the interface, which is like a high level of, of uh, variance there, but uh, we, you, you know, we can see that there's this problem developing over time with uh, increased memory usage. Um, the, interestingly, what, was, what they discovered was that uh, a lot of it came down to uh, problems with event listener code. Um, so be really careful with your uh, memory usage. Obviously, there's great tools for that using, you know, stuff like the, the Chrome Dev tools. You can get really, really good uh, snapshots of memory usage. Compare them before and after doing uh, actions. Plenty of tools for those. So a quick word uh, about power consumption. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen this brilliant article, uh, which actually it kind of makes this case for how... You know, like there is this real cost to uh, poorly designed websites, and uh, this is particularly true on mobile, where obviously you know uh, battery battery life is is crucial, and and it affects everything about the you know how well your app works on a mobile device. You know, there's actually this kind of cost in terms of global climate change. You know, to doing dodgy stuff on the web. Uh, it's it's a it's a great article. Um, so there's, there's a stack of ways that we can, uh, we can stop uh, our apps using, um, using you know, power that they don't need to. And there's a, a lot of stuff uh, picked up on in, in that article. Um, and uh, interesting, yeah, interesting, actually, one of the things, less pal palatable things they discovered was that uh, essentially tables use less power than divs. So there we go. Anyway, read the article. It's got, there's a lot of detail in there about uh, how you can uh, improve your stuff. Um, you can also, by the way, get access now. Uh, I think it's only now, it's coming to Chrome, but it's, it's, uh, it's in Firefox, but uh, this is going to be really uh, important to, uh, to your apps. I, um, the battery API, if anyone's seen this, it's, a really, it's just a lovely little simple API that gives you access to battery data from within, um, a, uh, from within the browser. And uh, the point about this is that you can use this to help your uh, users 
um, in situations where you, you know, you're aware that what they may be about to do in your app is potentially going to take some time or is going to use quite a lot of power. So you can use the, uh, the battery API maybe to check stuff or to warn them or just to keep them uh, up to date with, you know, just make them aware of these things. Um, I'll, you know, just make them aware of these things. Um, I'll just show you that in action now. Um, this is the, uh, this is Firefox Nightly. Um, let's have a look. If I refresh that now, you can see uh, it actually, the, the battery level went up there because I've been charging the battery. I, if I remove the cable, there we go. So we've had a charging change event meaning it's not charging, and then I think if I plug that back in, it should work. Chug, chug, chug. Yeah, and then it's back charging again. Um, so, you know, really useful. Um, so, you know, really useful stuff um, to help your users, uh, you know, to be able to warn your users if there's going to be a problem. And again, it's this perception of performance that's uh, crucial. Um, so... The kind of warning, I guess, in all that is that, uh, you know, if you're trying to improve your code and get better performance, just, you know, of course, uh, avoid this premature optimization of code. And, and you know, I think the, the worst problem for performance is often where you've got this kind of obfuscation that develops uh, where people are trying to do really uh, kind of detailed uh, performance improvements. Uh, and you get these kind of maintainable code bases. And, uh, the, you know, despite the fact that JavaScript is slow, uh, JavaScript is also really fast in a lot of ways. So, you know, trying to optimize uh, loops and so on can actually, I think, you know, sometimes cause some JavaScript optimizations in your algorithms can actually make more problems. Uh, so just be aware of that. And, yeah, just to say also, you know, kind of ignore everything I said because... Uh, it may not work for you, you know, and the point is that you have to test, you know, whatever you do, test. Um, and we have a stack of tools for that because, you know, everything's going to change. Everything will be different in six months. We know that's the case. Um, and what we really need to do is to be able to measure, you know, measure performance actually in the browser. Now, we've got a stack of great tools for, uh, for remote debugging in the Chrome developer tools. Um, we've also got uh, Firefox now is uh, working with uh, Wi-Fi remote uh, debugging. There's, there's not a lot of functionality in the tools yet, but it's, it's great to be able to use Wi-Fi. Um, a stack of other, uh, other tools there. Um, obviously, the, uh, there are JavaScript uh, benchmarking tools, and this is crucial for working out you know, how things uh, compare side by side from, with real data to keep this data driven. And I think my favorite... Uh, the feature now in the browser, you know, to do with uh, performance measurement is, is the window performance object. So if you haven't seen this, th this, th this measures uh, load speeds and navigation timings. Uh, and there's a stack of information there. Th these are the values you get uh, in epoch time terms. Um, and it gives you the ability to do things like... Uh, you know, check uh, in detail between when page load started and when page load ended and so on and so on. And the good thing is that that uh, stuff is available in Google Analytics. Um, so it's actually, if you're using Google Analytics on your mobile site, you can get access to the window performance data um, actually from your analytics pages. Um, there's a stack of other good tools there um, that uh, you may be aware of, but, uh, you know, check all those out. Um, and one final point I really want to make is, you know, the kind of old thing of Jacob Nielsen's, uh, this idea of discount usability. So the sense, you know, is of, you don't need a big usability lab to test performance, you know, just like when you've built your stuff, you know, give it to your friends, give it to your, you know, your, your wife, daughter, dog, whatever, um, get them to have a go on stuff, test stuff, try it out with real people, because that's always the, uh, the thing that's going to be the most, uh, kind of most informative. Um, so there's a stack of more information. I think these are some of, I think some of the best resources we've got on the web. Um, the, the figures from HTTP Archive Mobile are, are really uh, enlightening about what people are actually doing on the mobile web and uh, it kind of gives you a sense of where you can improve your own material. Um, 
Obviously, uh, Chrome, for, Chrome for mobile platforms for Android and iOS is pretty new. Um, you know, we really, really appreciate your, your feedback at this point. Um, we're, uh, we're, you know, really looking to, to hear what, you, what your experiences are of the APIs. And uh, please, if you've never filed a bug, you know, today is the day. Um, go to new.mcrbug.com, that's, you know, mobile Chrome bugs, and file a bug if you've got something you want or something that doesn't work properly. Um, so thanks very much. Like I say, the slides are online if you need to get at those links. Um, I'm happy to take questions now, but I'll be around during the day as well, around the sort of Google booth or just wandering about. So if anyone's got questions, uh, yeah. Do you think that uh, responsive design is compatible with good performance? Say that again. Uh, do you think that responsive design is compatible <laughs> with uh, good performance? Yeah, there's a question there about, uh, about res is responsive design compatible with... Uh, with good performance, and I think absolutely. I mean, I think the thing, the two things can go hand in hand. Where, you know, we get, uh, we can get the right image, images for the right context. Um, the the interesting point made in in that uh, article about network compression. You know, his point was, responsive design is pointless, <laughs> because the uh, networks are doing image compression, and everything we do will go wrong. Uh, the problem with that argument is that. A lot of the networks aren't doing image compression, and uh, we've still got, you know, we still need, it's still a problem that needs to be solved by us. Um, there's no perfect way, but, uh, but you know, I think we, we, responsive design should be all about performance, I think, getting the right stuff for the right context. Any other questions? Shout out if you're there. It's a bit hard to see with the lights. No other questions? Okay, well, thanks very much. Great to see everyone.